Hi, my name is Richard Hartline, and I would like to speak heart to heart today uh, concerning the subject of false teachers and false teaching and false prophets in the Bible and how they relate to us today and what we see around this. My purpose today is to try to biblically show why we are admonished um, to do this, to, to be, have our eyes open, to expose false teachers and false prophets. Uh, um, the purpose of this uh, recording today is not to talk about specific people or specific false teachers, but to lay down the biblical precedent that we as believers have to do this. First of all, the Bible says we are to try them. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. The church in Ephesus was commended because they had tried them which said they were apostles and are not, and you have found them as liars. That's in Revelation chapter 2, 2. And then the church of Pergamos was rebuked because they tolerated those that held the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. That's Re Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It's never right to tolerate false teachers, but they are to be tried by the word of God and exposed. But the problem is this, that those who want to disobey the word of God will seek by every means to avoid this teaching. That's the problem. The Bible also says we're to mark and to avoid them. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, doctrine which we have learned, and avoid them, Romans 16, 17. And I just want to reiterate that uh, the purpose of this uh, recording is not to specifically name any false doctrine or false teachers. Um, in this particular recording, but it is to give the biblical precedent that it's not only okay, but it's commanded for us to do. It's not unloving or unkind to point out false teachers, false doctrine. Now, you know, the Bible refers to these people as wolves in sheep's clothing. So by not warning the sheep, we're actually opening the door to the sheep pen and allowing the wolves to come in and devour the sheep. We're, what we're saying is, come on in, Wolfie, Wolfie. I got some lamb chops for you to eat. The Bible also says we are to rebuke them face to face or any way we can. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Titus 1, 13. You know, this was written to Titus because there were those who were going from house to house subverting whole households with false doctrine. This is very similar to what is going on today uh, in the church as far as Christian uh, broadcasting and, and Christian TV and much of the silly doctrine that's coming across the airwaves into these households. You know, a good meaning for discernment is this. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. In the Gospels, there are 14 scripture references to, uh, in reference to false teachers, false doctrine, and false prophets. 18 in the epistles. So do you think it's just a little important? Do you think that somebody should be at least paying attention to these things? You know, if something's in the Bible once, it's important. If it's in there twice, it's very, very important. And if it's in there three times, it's over the top. But 14 times in the Gospels and 18 times in the Epistles, I think it's important. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Also, Jesus said, not everyone who says to be Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I said, and then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So we could be building great churches. We could be missionaries. We can be uh, Christian broadcasters, have great TV shows, record albums, um, uh, famous artists, and none of that matters. What, does, what matters to Jesus? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's what's important to Jesus. And that's what's in the scripture. 
And that's what the church in America is missing. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 2, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you who will secretly, secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. One more scripture here from Ephesians 5, 11 through 13. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, the thing about reproving people and bringing to light, uh, this is all, often labeled as unloving, unkind, uh, who are you to judge? You're dividing the body of Christ. And uh, this has nothing to do with what scripture says, because the scripture says any unfruitful work of darkness were to expose them, not cover them up, and just sweep them under the carpet. This is Paul talking in Acts. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. This is a charge to shepherds. Listen to this real closely. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, even among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn you every one night and day with tears. So I think it's clear. I think it's so evident that we are to expose false teachers and false doctrine. Now, here's the biggie. Are we permitted, are we commanded, or are we forbidden to name false teachers and false prophets by name? You know, many mistakenly believe that it's wrong to expose error and then to name the guilty teachers, but they are wrong according to the Bible. Uh, I want to give scripture for all this, and uh, and I don't like to usually use antidotes, but uh, I would like to use this one. If there was a child molester living across the street, and your child was going to that person's house, I'm going to tell you, name and address, and to avoid him. I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, beware of child molesters. Uh, I'm not going to name the name because I don't want to hurt them. So. To not name a false teacher who is deceiving somebody, they're being deceived, would be ridiculous. All right? But let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Paul himself named Peter publicly. Peter was guilty of an unscriptural practice. He was mixing the law with grace. And here it is. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him, Paul said, face to face, because he was to be blamed. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, before them all, in front of them all, if thou, being a Jew, lives after the manner of the Gentiles, and not to the Jews, then why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul named Demas for loving the world. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Paul also named Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul told Timothy to war a good warfare, holding faith and good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith, and have made shipwreck, of who is Hymenaeus and Alexander, there they are, the names, who I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Paul also named Hymenaeus and Philetus. He told Timothy to study that he might be able to rightly divide the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does the canker of who Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is already past, and overthrow the faith of some. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 through 18. Paul also named Alexander the coppersmith. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. 
John also named Diotrephes. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, received us not. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that the Bible not only teaches, but commands us to expose false teachers, false prophets, and false doctrine, and name those false teachers and those false prophets by name when necessary. This is Richard Hartline, loving you enough to tell you the truth.
Roger's word is a word for the hour. It is the hour for the body of Christ. Beware of men who bring miracles without fruit. Beware of men who do not display the fruit of the Spirit and yet display the miracle. Beware of men who emphasize what you do not have and yet do not show it in their own lives. Beware of the man that says that we do not pray enough and yet by his own life and by his own answers to prayer does not lead you into prayer. There are wolves around. They're going to emerge. When they see there's something worth getting hold of, when they see that there's been something born here, wolves are going to emerge and they're going to seek to lead the sheep away. And they'll do it either by deceit and by the use of miracle or by condemnation. This fellowship has already been saved from one such man, as Roger has talked about, two, three years ago. We refuse to open the door of this fellowship and we refuse to open the door of all the fellowships that we were related to. In three weeks, I may have told you this before, in three weeks that man had gone round other fellowships and there were eight cases of immorality in three weeks. Why? Because the man had a powerful prophetic gift which covered up deceit in his heart. But Morris and myself smelt that man out and we did not allow him through that door. So put your trust in your leaders. Put your trust in the household group leaders. We have opened the door to Roger. We believe that he is of the same spirit, that God has dealt with him. Young man though he is, God has laid ministry upon his heart. And as leaders, I just want to say this tonight, every one of us who lead in any way, as wives to our children, as husbands to our families, as local house group leaders to our groups, as elders to the fellowship, as ministries to the nation, we are the doors, just as Jesus was the door. And let us open ourselves up to, to the good that God is bringing. Let us always be ready to receive from outside, but let us beware of letting anything in. In 1946, Charles Price said, one of the best healing ministries that we've seen, he said, that there was going to come a spate of miracles that would damage the body of Christ almost beyond repair. Mm -hmm. But after that, there would come a true awakening of God yes. that would be yes. greater than anything that yes. the church has ever seen. <clears throat> I believe we are being prepared for such a time as that. Not because we're anything, yeah. but because He is everything. Yeah. And He is going to be manifested through us. Let's just say, yeah. Father, the hour is late. But we want to be delivered, A, from the pressure of having to stay when we know we ought to go. We want to be free to be able to leave a meeting. And we also want to be delivered from the tradition of having to finish at 10 o'clock. We want to be able to finish at 9, quarter to 11. So, Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for our brother's ministry. We receive it. We embrace it. And we ask that you will establish the doors of our homes, of our fellowships. That whole households may not be subverted by false teachers, but that we are truly covered in these days. Not smothered, Lord, but covered. Bless the elderships. Bless the husbands. Bless the wives. Bless the teenagers that are emerging into leadership of the young. Bless each and every one. Bless the musicians. Let them be doors. Bless the prophets. Bless the practical workers, Lord, that we each one might take up our place and that in this way you might restore the supernatural element of the church. I know, Lord, we know, Lord, that it's the age of restoration. Yeah. We're going to see it flooding. Yeah. We can't force it. We can't squeeze it out. We try, Lord. But you are restoring. The hour is coming. Oh. Hallelujah. When you're going to manifest your glory in your house. And we're not in it because of that, Lord. We're in it for the eternal blessing and joy of being with you. But we know you're going to manifest that power. So be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name. Consolidate what's been said. Yes. Amen. Roger's word is a word for the hour. It is the hour for the body of Christ. Beware of men who 
who bring miracles without fruit. Beware of men who do not display the fruit of the Spirit and yet display the miracle. Beware of men who emphasize what you do not have and yet do not show it in their own lives. Beware of the man that says that we do not pray enough and yet by his own life and by his own answers to prayer does not lead you into prayer. There are wolves around. They're going to emerge. When they see there's something worth getting hold of, when they see that there's been something born here, wolves are going to emerge and they're going to seek to lead the sheep away. And they'll do it either by deceit and by the use of miracle or by condemnation. This fellowship has already been saved from one such man, as Roger has talked about, two, three years ago. We refuse to open the door of this fellowship and we refuse to open the door of all the fellowships that we were related to. In three weeks, I may have told you this before, in three weeks that man had gone round other fellowships and there were eight cases of immorality in three weeks. Why? Because the man had a powerful prophetic gift which covered up deceit in his heart. But Morris and myself smelt that man out and we did not allow him through that door. So put your trust in your leaders. Amen. Put your trust in the household group leaders. Amen. We have opened the door to Roger. We believe that he is of the same spirit, that God has dealt with him. Young man though he is, God has laid ministry upon his heart. And as leaders, I just want to say this tonight, every one of us who lead in any way, as wives to our children, as husbands to our families, as local house group leaders to our groups as elders to the fellowship as ministries to the nation we are the doors just as jesus was the door and let us open ourselves up to to the good that god is bringing let us always be ready to receive from outside but let us beware of letting anything in in 1946 charles price said one of the best healing ministries that we've seen he said that there was going to come a spate of miracles that would damage the body of Christ almost beyond repair. Mm -hmm. But after that, there would come a true awakening of God yes. that would be greater than anything that yes. the church has ever seen. <clears throat> I believe we are being prepared for such a time as that. Not because we're anything, but because He is everything. Amen. And He is going to be manifested through us. Let's just say, Father, the hour is late. But we want to be delivered, A, from the pressure of having to stay when we know we ought to go. We want to be free to be able to leave a meeting. And we also want to be delivered from the tradition of having to finish at 10 o'clock. We want to be able to finish at 9, quarter to 11. So, Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for our brother's ministry. We receive it. We embrace it. And we ask that you will establish the doors of our homes, of our fellowships, that whole households may not be subverted by false teachers, but that we are truly covered in these days, not smothered, Lord, but covered. Bless the elderships. Bless the husbands. Bless the wives. Bless the teenagers that are emerging into leadership of the young. Bless each and every one. Bless the musicians. Let them be doors. Bless the prophets. Bless the practical workers, Lord, that we each one might take up our place and that in this way you might restore the supernatural element of the church. I know, Lord, we know, Lord, that it's the age of restoration. We're going to see it flooding in. We can't force it. We can't squeeze it out. We try, Lord. But you are restoring. The hour is coming. Hallelujah. When you're going to manifest your glory in your house. And we're not in it because of that, Lord. We're in it for the eternal blessing and joy of being with you. But we know you're going to manifest that power. So be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Consolidate what's been said. Yes. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. I've said many times, I've taught a study here, a teaching here one time on 
you went in trouble, remember your H. That's an old saying from down south. When in trouble, remember your H. Romans chapter 8 is what you want to remember. And then verse 8, 18, 28, and 38 are the verses in the chapter to remember. You remember those passages, and they'll give you a, 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 uh, a, 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 an anchor, something to be an anchor for your soul, steadfast and sure, to get you through the problems of life. I want you to look at verse 18, Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the suffering in this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice how Paul recognizes that there is a present time suffering and that there is a future glory to be revealed. Someone has said that creation, when God made, made creation in Genesis, he said it was good. When sin entered, groaning came on the scene. And then one day it's going to be glory. The glory, verse number 20, uh, uh, verse number 19, he says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. God has a liberation plan for creation. For we know, verse 22, now watch this, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What God's Word says, if you live, the Lord, tar the Lord tarries, and you live a natural life, you're going to groan and travail. There's going to be suffering and pain and ultimately death in your future. We know, we know from experience, we know because God's Word tells us that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Look around you. The songwriter said, change and decay, all about I see. Now you've got preachers that will come along and tell you, yeah, but that won't be true of you if you're a believer. Because if you're a believer, God will come and He's going to heal you and He doesn't want you sick and God doesn't want you to be, to be uh, uh, you know, the health and wealth stuff. He doesn't want you to be sick. He doesn't want you to be in poverty. And so God will, tell you, once you trust Jesus, God will work in your behalf and get rid of that. You know what that is? That's balderdash. Somebody needs to get on a program like this on a television and tell you that is just a bunch of hooey. Now that's Alabama talk, I understand, but you... I bet you understood it, didn't you? You know what it is? It's a lie out of the pit of hell is what it is. Because it takes people in desperate straits, reaches into the pool of their emotions, gets a grip on their heart, twists it, and just sucks out the life. And you know why preachers tell you that? They tell you that primarily to get your money. They tell you that primarily to get your support to get you on their team. And the money might not be dollar bills, it might just be your influence. But that's what they're after. How do I, why do I say that? Why would I come on here and make such a bold, arrogant sounding statement? I'm not trying to be arrogant. I am trying to talk to you plain, put it waist high right across the plate where you get it, I don't want you to think I'm saying the, thing, the same thing everybody else is saying because when you preach God's Word rightly divided, you aren't saying what religion is saying. And you aren't saying what the trumped up form of religion, the religionized version of Christendom called Christendom is saying. Verse 23, watch it carefully. Romans 8, 22. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they... But ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's believers. Filled with the Spirit of God. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. There is a healing program for the members of the church, the body of Christ today. It's called the adoption. It's called the resurrection. It's called the moment when Jesus Christ comes and changes your mortal body, your vile body, and fashions it like in His glorious body. Now until the moment of the resurrection, change and decay and all about you can expect to see. You know why you get physically ill? You know why physical sickness comes into your life? It's not because God is mad at you. 
It's, be, it's not because God doesn't have you on his heart. It's not because God hasn't prepared anything for you. It's because we live in a fallen creation. The Wolf in Sheep's Clothing A wolf found it very difficult in getting to the sheep because of the vigilance of the shepherd and his dogs. But one day it found the skin of a sheep that had been flayed and thrown aside. And so it put the sheepskin on over its own pelt and walked down among the sheep. A lamb began to follow the wolf in sheep's clothing around. And so the wolf led the lamb away from the others and made a meal of her. For many days he was successful in tricking the sheep, and he had many hearty meals. Appearances can be deceptive. Like Babylon, Jezebel is intriguingly mentioned in Revelation. So like Babylon, this means there's a Jezebel spirit that hasn't ever gone away and won't go away until God deals with it directly at the end of time. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Notice that phrase at the end. God refers to Satan's deep secrets. This is a direct reference to the secret serpent knowledge from Eden that forms the basis of the mysteries that occultists are so anxious to know. Now obviously the literal person of Jezebel is not going to be present in Thyatira as she died thousands of years ago in 2 Kings in the Bible. The reference is a prophetic parallel. Just as John the Baptist was Elijah because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, this person or influence in Thyatira will be under the spiritual control of the same demonic influences that controlled Jezebel. Thus there is a type of demonic influence in society today and the church because this passage in Revelation 2 was written to the church that can rightly be called by the name Jezebel. This demonic spirit existed long before Queen Jezebel and indeed goes back to Samiramis. 
but Jezebel is so totally controlled by its nature that she has become its namesake. We also know far more about the characteristics of the spirit through Jezebel than Semiramis because her story is recorded in 2 Kings. But whatever is true of the nature of Jezebel was true of the nature of Semiramis because they were both controlled by the same spirit. The spirit of Semiramis is the spirit of Jezebel, which is the spirit of Astarte or Ashtoreth or Asherah, which is the spirit of witchcraft. In scripture, Herodias is also a type of this force. As Jezebel opposed Elijah, so Herodias opposed John the Baptist. So what about this Jezebel spirit? A Jezebel spirit, above all, seeks domination and to achieve this end, she uses manipulation and intimidation. Now, although Jezebel is commonly referred to as a she, as a spirit, she can exhibit behaviours that are associated with both males and females. For example, people who recognise they are weaker than those they seek to control tend to use manipulation. This is normally true of females who may use tears, hurt feelings and emotional guilt to get what they want. People who feel stronger than those they want to control tend to intimidate. This is more characteristic of men who may use strength, violence or other forms of intimidation to control others for their own ends. Different methods, but the same goal, domination. This is the definition of witchcraft. The Jezebel spirit will use manipulation while she feels she's in a position of weakness, but once she has acquired the power, will switch to intimidation. We can see this in the way she threatened to murder Elijah, and I keep referring back to our plan A and plan B concept. Plan A is the female manipulative way to dominate, and plan B is the masculine violent and intimidating way to dominate. Interestingly, the female method is far more socially acceptable in modern society. I once heard a girl boasting that she could get guys to do anything she wanted. All she had to do was lure them with her beauty, which is the essence of femininity, and she had them in the palm of her hand. What she didn't realise is that the guy could equally use his superior physical strength, which is the essence of masculinity, to force her to do what he wanted, but he didn't. So if the guy didn't dominate her with his strength, perhaps she shouldn't dominate him with her beauty. But the subtle feminine method of control is considered almost normal in society, and so it goes on all the time unchallenged. Overt intimidation and violence, on the other hand, will put the perpetrator in jail. Spiritually, Christians should view both forms as equally offensive. Both are aiming for domination and control over another person, which is witchcraft. Now referring back to the Jonathan Livingston seagull example, where the demons behaved like seagulls as they were being expelled and had taken on the characteristics of the thing from where they had originated, we can conclude that since the Jezebel spirit originated with Semiramis, it would follow that it has her characteristics. This spirit therefore seems more comfortable operating through women and initially tends to establish control without the use of actual physical force. She is more easily associated with classic feminine persuasion techniques and the Bible always refers to her as a woman. You will often find the Jezebel spirit trying to get close to those who already have control. Proverbs says, Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Scripture emphasizes that the intended target of the spirit is strong men. It primarily targets men with leadership skills or powerful positions such as Nimrod and Ahab. But in reality she has a deep hatred of true spiritual authority and will always seek to replace it with illegitimate authority. She will do this through emotional pressure, witchcraft and obsessive sensuality. But make no mistake, lust and sex are merely tools to weaken others in order for her to accomplish her goal. The subtle persuasions of femininity are used only to gain influence and to get close to those in control. She then uses this position to gradually dominate. In the Hebrew, the name Jezebel means literally, without cohabitation. She will not live with those she cannot dominate and control. She will have no equals. We saw evidence of this when Semiramis ordered the death of Nimrod and plotted to do the same to Tamutz. There are no ends she will not go to in order to gain and keep control. It is what Jezebel wants more than anything. Domination is always satanic and stands in contrast to the example given to us by Jesus, the servant king.
who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Even when Jezebel appears to be submissive, it is usually out of carefully wrought plan to gain influence. In 1 Kings 21.8 we read, Jezebel wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent them to the elders and nobles of the city. This tells us that she prefers to remain concealed in the background while she manipulates situations and leaders, a hidden hand behind the public figure, just like Satan is the king of Tyre pulling the strings behind the prince of Tyre. The power of the spirit of Jezebel should not be underestimated. For seven years God had carefully and miraculously protected Elijah from Ahab's armies. God had even commanded ravens to feed him in the wilderness. He had supernaturally met all his needs. In the Mount Carmel showdown, Elijah called down fire from heaven and resoundingly defeated and killed the priests of Baal. All Israel fell at his feet in repentance, worshipping the true God. Elijah was one of the mightiest prophets of God that the world had ever seen. He was vindicated and victorious. And yet it took a single threat from Jezebel to send Elijah spinning into anxiety and even depression. He fled to the desert and begged God to kill him. Think about this, because naturally speaking, it makes no sense. Elijah enjoyed supernatural protection for seven years, watched fire fall from heaven, saw his enemies defeated, and still Jezebel could bring him to this condition with a single threat. This is an example of Jezebel's power to intimidate and strike fear into the hearts of men, causing them to withdraw. Jezebel will try to steal your vision. Jezebel will even make you depressed and anxious when there is nothing significantly different in your circumstances. And if there are difficult circumstances, this spirit will tell you that they are insurmountable, impossible and overwhelming. Jezebel will make you feel like dying when in reality, you are God's man of the hour. Spiritual life may seem irrelevant and pointless. You may lose the desire to pray and the faith to try. Demonic voices will tell you it's all hopeless. You may suddenly find yourself in unreasonable anxiety, fearing tragedy or death, pessimistic and cynical. Much of what is called depression is actually Jezebel. Jezebel wants to paralyze with fear, condemnation, depression, apathy, or whatever it takes until we withdraw. The only answer for those under Jezebel's attack is perseverance in battle. And remember, the God who resoundingly defeated Baal on Carmel can do the same today. Immediately after Israel was established in the promised land of Canaan, it was governed by a system of judges and God was considered to be their supreme ruler or king. But by the time of 1 Samuel, the people started to demand a human king in order to be like the other nations around them. In spite of God's warnings about this, they persisted with the request and God obliged. The first human king was Saul, who was soon replaced by David, and this takes us into the book of 1 Kings in the Bible, where the subsequent succession of kings are documented. These transitions of leadership led to a downward spiral and the eventual division of Israel, and throughout it all we see a constant invasion of Baal worship over the years, Satan was still going with plan A at this point. The pivotal figure was King Ahab, and just as Nimrod's importance was hinted at by the extra attention given to him in Genesis, the same can be said of King Ahab in the book of 1 Kings. The writer makes sure to elaborate on his reign and to tell us his story in greater depth than the other kings. The Bible says of Ahab that he did evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. This guy was the worst of the worst. There had been bad kings before, but no one touched Ahab. Not only this, but he married a woman called Jezebel, who was the princess daughter of Ethbal, Canaanite king of Tyre and Sidon, and priest of Astarte. You couldn't get a worse combination of titles, and clearly this was not the kind of family the king of Israel should have been marrying into. For a people that God was intent on keeping undefiled and pure, this marriage would pose significant problems. As expected, soon after their marriage, the pollution began. Ahab established a temple for Baal and an Asherah pole in Israel for his wife's sake. An Asherah pole is basically an obscene phallic symbol, otherwise known as an obelisk. 
But Queen Jezebel was not content to simply allow the worship of Baal and Asherah concurrently with the worship of Israel's true God. She was determined to eliminate worship of the true God altogether. She embarked on a campaign whereby most of God's prophets were killed and in their place were installed false prophets for Baal and Asherah. She successfully controlled Ahab, implemented idol worship and had him build a temple in their honour. As a result, the biblical record shows Israel plunging from the heights of David's glorious and godly reign to the depths of the pagan idolatry and Satanism under Ahab. And this was in many ways Israel's darkest hour. Satan was very close to winning God's chosen people to himself once and for all. The apostasy of Israel was almost complete. The foundations of godliness were fast crumbling. The judgment of God was forthcoming. Now, do Ahab and Jezebel remind you of anyone? They were virtually identical to Nimrod and Semiramis. It's almost as though Satan thought to himself that since this tactic had worked so well in Babylon, it might just be the one that would finally clinch victory in the battle to subvert the Israelites. Like when a play or a shot works particularly well in sports, you're tempted to use it again in the hope it produces the same result. This is what he was doing. He was attempting to create the same kind of structure within Israel that he had created in Babylon and was hoping the same end would be achieved. Just as Samiramis had risen to power on the coattails of Nimrod, the evil Jezebel wed herself to Ahab and introduced idolatry into their life as an evil religious practice. This was probably not a marriage of love. Rather, it was a spiritual and political affiliation designed to merge two different kingdoms. Just as Semiramis had an insatiable lust for power and would go to any ends to retain it, even killing her husband and plotting to kill her son, we see the same kind of spirit in Jezebel, a lust for power, control and domination. Given her background in Baal worship where sex acts and licentious living was exalted as a way to tap into the power of the gods, she would have had no qualms about sleeping her way to the top. Ahab king of Israel, was completely subdued and dominated by Jezebel. Israel was now full of pagan shrines, filled with priestess prostitutes, servicing the worshippers. The sexual lure was more than the men of Israel could resist. By Jezebel's influence, 10 million Israelites left the worship of God for Baal and Ashtoreth. Only 7,000 people in the entire nation were not swayed by her control. This is how close Satan came to claiming Israel and thus removing the last remaining barrier between him and world domination. God, however, as always, had a man for the job, Elijah. Jezebel had killed most of God's prophets but hadn't managed to get her hands on Elijah yet, and it was he who God used to turn Israel back from the brink. It all took place on Mount Carmel, a direct showdown between God and Baal. The Jezebel spirit is born out of witchcraft and rebellion and is one of the most common spirits in operation today. It is a powerful enemy of the body of Christ, the church. It operates freely on even sincere believers whose hearts are for God individually and has also attained positions of power within churches. In the secular world, these people are often thought to suffer from narcissistic personality disorder, paranoia, and are often labeled as psychopaths or just plain nasty, arrogant, or even plain evil. Yet the most accurate and complete description of the characteristics of these people is to be found within a spiritual context. 
This particular spirit, though only one of many malicious spirits, establishes its stronghold primarily in women. However, many men have been victimized by it as well, where it functions as a controlling spirit. In the wake of every person controlled by the Jezebel spirit is a life of chaos, confusion, instability, broken relationships, and destruction. Every person that ever came into close contact with it has seen aggressive attempts to divide their relationships with their loved ones. While Jezebel's belief system is incorrect, they are very firmly held beliefs. Jezebels are usually people of deep convictions. As mentioned, many people controlled by the Jezebel spirit have a true heart for God and earnestly desire to serve him. The original Jezebel, the spirit's first noteworthy victim, Queen of Israel, was devotedly religious but was at total enmity with God. She worshiped at the altar of Baal, worship of the flesh. Modern day Jezebels may indeed believe they are serving the one true God. However, the true hidden agenda is self-worship. As Fushia Pickett points out in her book, The Next Move of God, the Jezebel spirit's mission is to kill the prophets, as it tried and often has throughout time. The goal of the victim is usually quite different, to gain identity, glory, recognition, power, and satisfy the need for acknowledgement and worth from others. In other words, the praise of men. Matthew chapter 6, 2, 5, and 16. This is an outgrowth of desire for love and self-worth we all have with the wrong focus, self. As a secondary mission, the Jezebel spirit seeks to emasculate all men or divest them of their authority and power over others. It fosters a distrust and or hatred of men in general and nurtures motives of vengeance in the victim towards some men in particular, usually as a result of abuse or neglect by a significant male in the victim's life. We attach a female gender to this spirit, but really it has no gender. It is a sea thing, terribly aggressive, very determined, callous, controlling, narcissistic, power hungry, manipulative, unrepentant, deceitful, and overwhelmingly evil spirit. And those are mostly only its good points. This spirit is definitely Satan's woman. Probably most deceiving to many is that Jezebel was religious and did religious things. She was the daughter of Ethabel, meaning with Baal. She converted her husband Ahab to follow Baal. Ahab married her against God's command. The name Jezebel specifically means without dwelling or habitation. A true explanation of Jezebel can clearly be described as the worship of self. The clear battle with the Jezebel spirit is over people. In the church, that spirit desires to rule and control the people of God. If we are not people of decision, we will fall under the spell of the Jezebel spirit. She is a supporter of and heavily influential in religious organizations as well as politics. While Jezebel is religious, she wells her false power against the true prophetic flow of God. She hates the prophets and all prophetic ministries. Specifically, she hates repentance, humility, and intercessory prayer because they destroy her strongholds of stubbornness and pride. Jezebels love to project a sense of power they do not have. It is based on intimidation in order to cloud the minds of those they desire to oppress. How frequently that spirit tries to wield influence in the church, in spiritual organizations? If you don't see it my way, I will just pull out and you can't deal without me and all the work I prepared, I will keep. Yes, 
If one does not go along with his or her actions, there will be consequences. Intimidation always seek to move the person through threats. This use of fear puts the victim under control out of fear of losing something precious to him. This is blackmail, ladies and gentlemen, and far from God's love, because these are all improper channels, use of illegitimate power and authority, projection of power that is not ours to use. This by no means insinuates that a person shouldn't stand up for himself, but rather that it should be done through proper channels. Manipulating, intimidating, and dominating another human being are blatant uses of control and illegitimate authority. Jezebel uses other people as objects where it suits her need to gain control, influence, and power. Once she has gained the control desired, she generally rejects and tosses the people aside. If they are in her family, she does this emotionally. Jezebel displays angry, vicious, and sometimes violent behavior when opposed. She will turn on the one who refuses to do her will or submit to her, especially if she has been successful in manipulating this person in the past, frequently with vicious, berating verbal attacks aimed at humiliation. The emotional damage caused by these outbreaks can be devastating to the one at whom she directed her wrath. This is often the source of terrible emotional wounds for her children and spouse. When this angry behavior happens in public, it often exposes the true spirit in operation to others who may have been previously deceived. No is the operative word for Jezebel. When those in spiritual authority say no to her, she is ready for war. Remember, Jezebel is a warring spirit who is always dressed for battle. Have you ever felt insecure? Be careful. Jezebel loves to flow in the realm of insecurity. In addition to destroying those around her, Jezebel especially hates the victim she is controlling. Remember, the mission of Jezebel, to kill the prophets. The victim is often herself anointed of God to be prophetic and will ultimately cause her victim to self-destruct. This is the Black Widow Spider Syndrome of the Jezebel spirit. Black Widow Spiders kill their mates. In the spirit realm, there are two implications. One, the Jezebel seeks to kill the male authority figure or prophet, and two, she seeks to kill her victim, which is made it to her when Jezebel takes control of their life. Jezebel's rival authority, which means to despise or show no respect for it. Building on fear of authority, especially since men are frequently the authority figures who originally hurt them, coupled with rebellion, she hates anyone placed in authority over her and seeks to destroy them and take their power. An early manifestation in childhood is a lack of respect for self or others and no respect for positions, either theirs or others. Jezebel is a classic backstabber. She will smile at you, give you a hug and a kiss, and then, as soon as you turn around, stab you in the back, repeatedly, with vigor, enjoying every wound she inflicts. She is a most vicious and devious spirit. Beware. Control and manipulation are the strongest parts of the Jezebel nature. These are the spirits of witchcraft and are extremely dangerous. Nearly everything that Jezebel does utilizes one or both spirits to attain her goal. Jezebel is the ultimate manipulator and nobody is better at manipulation than the person, victim, being controlled by this spirit. But Jezebel cannot control you until she first seduces you. Beware of flattery, smooth prophetic sayings, and seducing tears from this spirit. Jezebel loves 
false spiritual government. She knows how to create, flow, and operate in it. She views children as tools and weapons to manipulate your heart to advance her goals. Jezebel is like a shark. She is most vicious and dangerous. She circles the lives of others looking for teachable, seducible, controllable disciples of her own. Jezebel likes to birth spiritual children of her own as she looks for disciples to eat from her own table. She will look for those that are in rebellion, who are weak, wounded, or those who are contending and fighting spiritual authority. She knows how to use deep emotional hurts and wounds to manipulate and control as she creates soul ties with you. Jezebel loves to pull people under herself and away from those who can truly speak into their lives. Jezebel knows how to stir you up because she flows best in whirlwind of confusion and turmoil. She probes your soul, looking for your weaknesses. She is expert at developing soul ties and often does so. As previously mentioned, Jezebel will use any tool available to manipulate those around her to do her will. She often uses fear to manipulate people into submission. Jezebel is very possessive and domineering. She wants to control you. Jezebel loves power. Give me, give me, give me. You see, money is not really the issue with this spirit. It's power and authority that she's after. She likes to be in control of your life because she draws her strength from controlling you. That's why you feel spiritually drained after contending with her. The Jezebel principality wants to control you. She uses self-pity and her own weaknesses to manipulate another into submitting to her out of compassion or pity. She will even use prayer to manipulate the one she is attempting to control, especially prayers prayed audibly over that person to create the illusion that doing Jezebel's will is actually obeying God, or to generate fear or other emotion within the person which the Jezebel can use for the manipulation. Even though often powerfully gifted of the Lord, the Jezebel will frequently operate in the false discernment of the enemy by speaking words of knowledge gained from familiar spirits and not from the Spirit of God. This is witchcraft. The power of witchcraft is derived from Satan himself. Every attempt at manipulation or control sells out more to Satan and strengthens the deception that Jezebel is under. If you get between Jezebel and the person she is trying to control, she'll attack you viciously, trying her best to destroy your relationship with that person. She will try and destroy your reputation, set you up, and to separate you from her victim. Jezebels are attracted to people of power like moths to a flame. She'll connect herself with presidents, people in the media, people who have money, people of power. Often, a very intelligent, efficient, attractive, and even blatant Jezebel can be found serving at the feet of prominent leaders, even in the church. The deception and or seduction of the Jezebel is often so successful that the leader does not recognize who is at his right hand. The Jezebel's true desire is to risk the power from the person being served. If that person is prophetic in nature, the actual mission is to destroy them by any means available. Destroy their credibility, undermine their authority, discredit their ministry, cause them to fall in sexual temptation, etc. The Jezebel is extremely bossy by nature, though subtly with the low profile type. She is easily offended if her authority is questioned and will often respond with extreme anger at even the slightest offense. Two things have always plagued the church, 
control and desire to dominate. This power struggle has always divided and short-circuited the power of the church. The most cunning and yet most common way the spirit of Jezebel controls and operates is through manipulation. Manipulation is used in several ways, such as flattery, self-pity, hinting for something, etc. The use of manipulation to extract money is also used to fulfill one's own purpose. Ammunition too is another issue. Jezebels are continually collecting ammunition. They acquire information that they can use against you in case they ever begin to lose their grip of power. All of what they collected they would use against you without mercy and give it to others so that they can exploit it in the public to give you a bad self-image. Jezebels demand worship from others, the Queen Bee Syndrome. She must have dominance and control in her home. Other family members must exist to please her. For example, people that carry the Jezebel spirit are looking for people to basically praise them, to always be in support of what they're doing, to always be at their beck and call, to always be the yes man when they need something. You can't say no to this spirit. If you say no to Jezebel, there will be a major problem. So anytime the spirit of Jezebel is around, she will always want people to surround her with praise and attention that keeps her lifted at the forefront of everyone's mind. Many times the ones that carry the Jezebel spirit talk non-stop. They have a need to feel power and authority and they will do anything to achieve it. They feel they know more than anyone, therefore they dominate all conversations. Jezebel used talking as a form of control. In a typical conversation, he or she does all the talking whether it is about sports, the weather, or the kingdom of God. Because of this form of control, he or she is unable to receive input from anyone in his life. All conversations with him is one-sided. You are doing the listening. And if ever there is a break and you want to say something, the Jezebel switches off and does not hear you. One of its slay ways to slip away once confronted is to try to confuse you by changing the subject five times in one minute. Confusion keeps them undiscovered and unexposed. Therefore, it is impossible to converse with a Jezebel in logic. They would write several pages dealing with all sorts of other situations than the one you are confronting them with. The context would be so vague that no one would understand head or tails. If it is in conversation, they would simply talk nonsense to dilute and confuse you, never responding to your question. In this situation, one has to repeat the question and ask them only to respond to that question. They never do. They never will. This is very important for Christians to understand because when dealing with and confronting a person who carry the spirit of Jezebel, they will always run from questions. Jezebel is a master of criticism, murmuring, and complaining. Often those whom she is at enmity with are deliberately cursed in a conscious effort to punish and bring them back in line, to bring them back under her control. Jezebel firmly believes she has right on her side in doing these things and displays vicious and callous disregard for the well-being and independence of others having convinced herself that it is ultimately for their good as well as that she knows best and really has their best interest at heart in doing so. Those people who have been on the receiving side of Jezebel's curse feel the anger and the viciousness of her curses acutely and mainly succumb to them. However, for those under the protection of the cross, these curses are most often transformed into blessings instead, leaving the Jezebel sapped of emotional energy, frustrated, confused, and completely defeated 
wondering what went wrong. The Jezebel spirit actually hates and shuns repentance and humility. Because the Jezebel spirit is prideful and rebellious, she hates repentance and humility. These are two mighty weapons which can be used against her. This is also the key in discerning this spirit. A pride-filled, rebellious person refusing to repent has a Jezebel spirit. Is Jezebel a spirit or a work of the flesh? Simply put, Jezebel is a spirit, but it has found access through uncrucified flesh. You will never have a person with a controlling spirit admit he is wrong. It is always the fault of someone else. If you insist on an apology and confront the controller, you will probably get a screaming response such as, Yes, I'm wrong. I'm always wrong. This sarcastic spewing is a long way from repentance. Her expectations of others are always unrealistic because others cannot meet her demand for complete submission. If they do try, she despises them and casts them aside when she has what she wants out of them. Any attempting to relate to a person with this spirit is literally in a no-win situation. Nothing pleases this spirit. Jezebel can work through friends, relatives, and very often through committed Christians, true believers. The truth is, we are all susceptible to some of these behaviors. But when you find an ingrained pattern of these behaviors, when you encounter someone who goes to extreme lengths to appear perfect, even when they are clearly not, refusing to submit to critical self-examination, or be subject to criticism of friends and family, then you may as well start looking for the other telltale signs of this very dangerous spirit. When you find relationships in ruin and a trail of hurting, even traumatized people and stubborn refusal at responsible reconciliation attempts, look a little closer. When you find antagonism that goes beyond mere annoyance or irritation, stretching to a relentless aggression as opposed to passive pursuit to break someone in order to bring them to heal. Get very suspicious. When you are sent several messages bearing messages of intimidation, fear, and discouragement with the repeated reminder that you will never hear an apology and that you will only be allowed back into the fold or their terms know that Jezebel has sent her messengers to see you. Jezebels have a personality that has been shaped by controlling demonic thoughts. Therefore, the person must be willing to ruthlessly face truth and be willing to let God crucify his or her flesh. The flesh and its patterns must be subjected to the Holy Spirit daily in order for the person to be permanently set free from the Jezebel spirit. Discerning the Jezebel spirit. Use discernment and test the spirits. The victim controlled by the Jezebel spirit may exhibit many gifts and have a true heart for God. The reason she is a victim is that Jezebel is out to destroy her life, to kill her basically. The gifts and callings of God are given without repentance. Romans 11:29. In other words, the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit without regard to merit. You can't earn them. We are commanded to test the spirits according to 1 John 4:1, to test for Jezebel with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Remember, one, you shall know them by their fruits. Matthew 7:16, not their gifts. Two, Jezebel hates humility and repentance. She will refuse or dodge a call for either one of these to occur in her life or fake it if boxed in. She simply cannot and will not say she is sorry and even if somehow she is forced to do so, it is very clear that she is not sorry at all. Genuine repentance and humility is easy enough to discern. 
Three, easily apparent in any Jezebel is complete selfishness, a total lack of empathy for others, though at times these emotions are feigned, but it's not real concern. Four, the characteristics, personality, and methods of operation will usually manifest themselves openly at times. The seducer is often blatantly obvious to everyone except the person being seduced. Jezebel worships herself, keeps the focus on herself, except where a false attitude of compassion or humility serves her purpose. She has difficulty talking at length about anyone but herself, even when counseling others. She is very proud and often extremely vain. Many Jezebels are reasonably attractive and some very beautiful. However, much of the seduction and attractiveness is actually demonically derived giving them the ability to quickly form soul ties with people and thus proceed to control them, their lives and their futures. She now lives vicariously through them, drawing their strength from them while sapping them of their strengths. Bitterness and resentment against past hurts and offenses are nurtured in the victim by the Jezebel spirit because she knows a root of bitterness will grow like a cancer and manifest itself in all sorts of physical ailments which she can use as tools of manipulation. Of course, this cancer of bitterness is also slowly destroying the victim. In many cases, the countenance of the victim gradually grows more and more unattractive and in the end, Victims controlled by the Jezebel spirit may resemble the very witch like crones often used to symbolize witchcraft where this spirit is birthed. The victim rots from the inside out physically and spiritually and it shows people eventually find Jezebel's spiritual ugliness very repulsive. Many Jezebels will be drawn to the most influential Jezebel in operation. Though this is done unconsciously, it has the effect of creating a full-fledged and very effective witch's coven with a high priestess in charge with devastating results. Jezebels utilize the spirits of murmuring and complaint and criticism, which are servant spirits in her stronghold. She uses criticism of perceived faults in others to build up her own self-esteem and to justify her disobedience of or lack of respect for others. Because she tends to perfectionism, any fault she finds in others is grounds for disobeying their authority. She uses criticism as a tool to manipulate those around her and along with murmuring and complaint causes divisiveness to weaken her opposition and thereby to gain control over and to destroy them. When the Jezebel spirit is confronted with the truth, it will perceive the confronter as the enemy. Then it counterattacks with assaults against this enemy. In fact, no greater wrath seems to occur than when a controlling person is confronted. This person will never admit guilt or relinquish the sense of power and will retaliate against the confronter. Defensiveness is a common reaction when a suggestion is made. People who carry the Jezebel spirit are full of pride with a mixture of insecurity which is deep rooted as a stronghold in their mind. Carriers of this spirit cannot take correction because all correction is perceived as rejection to them. Therefore, you will never hear a person with a controlling Jezebel spirit admit he or she is wrong. It will always be the fault of someone else, never theirs. Never is there confession of guilt or true remorse. The Jezebel spirit is in contrast to the will of God. Her will goals and self-purposes has become her God. Her will must be accomplished regardless of the consequences and no matter who get hurt in the process.
Not only did Jezebel steal authority, she manipulated those in leadership. She used lies, distortions, and many other forms to get her way. The Lord waits for someone to confront those who carry the Jezebel spirit. Many succumb to the Ahab spirit and simply turn their heads from the tactics out of fear. They reason that, after all, she is very religious and popular and works hard in the church. Or, what would people think of me if I confront her? The greatest weakness among leaders today is the fear of confrontation. They want peace without paying the price of confronting the manipulating and controlling tactics of those who carry the Jezebel spirit. If you confront someone with the Jezebel spirit, they'll make accusations at you and call you bad names and every evil name in the book. You will see hatred like you never seen before. This will even come from people who greatly appreciate you and your calling. They will quickly make you out to be a bad guy by telling others that you're a false prophet, a false teacher, your ministry is a lie. They'll spread hate. They'll tell others, don't buy your tapes, don't buy your videos, don't even support their ministry, they're false, and convince them to not listen to anything you teach or say. People with this spirit will always act and carry themselves the same way when confronted. Sometimes carriers of the Jezebel spirit become temporarily remorseful and appear to be friendly or on your side, but soon she'll go right back to her controlling tactics the minute she or he don't get what they want. When it comes to prayer, she would be praying for her own agenda. There is no power in that. True fervent intercessory prayer causes hearts to change from pride to loftiness to repentance and humility. Nothing brings a greater death blow to the spirit of Jezebel. As it is typical of a Jezebel, she would complain that she wasn't appreciated enough to play with the emotions of others. In her self-centered nature, she would go to any lengths by lying and even exaggerating matters to make herself look spiritual and holy, super holy. After all, when being self-centered, no one is as important as they are. Jezebel's would state again and again that their decisions was the result of much prayer and fasting. She knows how to garner sympathy from others by knowing how to cry at the drop of a dime and fool almost anyone in sight. Don't let her tears fool you. They're designed to play with your emotions so that you can be on her side. She's very good at gathering people on her side to feel sorry for her. As for the Ahab spirit, it is known to abdicate his authority. It bespeaks of a mindset that avoids confrontation and denies fault. The spirit of Ahab is very weak and fearful. It loves its position but fears confrontation. 